Welcome to Porch Chats. I'm Colleen Condon, chair of the Charleston County Democrats, and today we have Ed Sutton with us. Welcome, Ed. Hey, how you guys doing? And we've got the third trip here as well, and you wanted to say hi to everybody. Hey, Trip. Hey, buddy. Say how hey, old buddy. Trip now? Trip is uh, four and a half months, and he's starting to get a little bit more mobile. We just got a, uh, a jumper for him the other day, and he loves that thing. So he spends a good bit of time during the day uh, jumping off the, uh, the door frame. <laughs> yeah, he's just going to get busier and busier and moving around more and more than you realize. Yep, yep. Now, Ed, you're running for house seat 114, is it? Yes, ma'am, you got it. Yeah, 114, uh, which is the upper half of West Ashley, and it goes into Dorchester uh, County as well. It's a district uh, population is just, uh, I think, over uh, 40,000 people, and the Ashley River kind of runs through the northern border, uh, border of the district, so it runs pretty much the entire length of the Ashley River. We've also got Bees Ferry, and uh, Highway 61 is kind of the spine of the district. This is Mary Tinkler's old seat. This is Mary Tinkler's old seat, yes, ma'am. Terrific. Well, tell us, what are you going to do when you get elected to the state house? Oh, gosh. Well, we've got a lot of plans. Uh, needless to say, a good bit of them have kind of adjusted in the last month, given the, uh, the current uh, you know, crisis that we're under with um, uh, COVID-19. Uh, so I think a big part uh, starting off is the, uh, as we know, the economic impact is probably going to be felt for, for years going forward. And uh, so a number of different things we've got to do there is, is one, kind of uh, get uh, the public health uh, sector uh, healthy again, uh, very much in favor of expanding uh, Medicaid uh, in the state to take care of uh, folks. But uh, also on the uh, economy front, how we help uh, small businesses get back on their feet and uh, be successful going forward. But I think a big part of it too is, uh, I think uh, most people know I'm an Air Force pilot. And uh, one of the things uh, we do really well in the Air Force is when you know something bad happens, when we have a, you know, an accident or incident or something like that, we uh, dissect it. We don't shy away from, from tragedy, from, from bad things. We go back and we look at every piece of what we call the air chain and how we got to this point. And I think that uh, kind of level of deep dive needs to be done at the state level because what's been identified real quickly is uh, our uh, unemployment assistance system is, is certainly well uh, underfunded, uh, which, right. is, which is not a good thing. And a lot of the uh, safety net things that uh, have been kind of chipped at, uh, chipped away at over the years uh, have not lived up to this crisis. And, and people are hurting. You know, uh, I know I just did an uh, informal poll on my uh, Facebook today about uh, small business administration assistance. And a lot of people have put their applications in, uh, but have not heard anything. And the, you know, the big problem is, uh, you know, a lot of folks just can't wait weeks or months for these checks to come in. You know, the business is going to uh, fold before then. So this is really an opportunity to kind of reassess uh, where our values are and, and realize that, hey, uh, whether the next crisis is another you know, virus or a hurricane or some kind of uh, major shutdown, we need to be prepared for it because, uh, I mean, there's just no debate in this. We, we were not prepared for this one, and, uh, and people are hurting as a result. I've got to tell you, I'm a little nervous that our legislature has not been able to act because of the very kind of conditions of the pandemic. We've yes, ma'am. Actually, really I'm going to hand uh, Trip off here. He is getting close to nap time, so he's going to go back inside. But uh, say bye, buddy, and thanks bye, for buddy. joining us, little guy. Um, yeah, you know, that's a really um, good point, especially, you know, we do have uh, a good bit of retirees in our, our legislature that are, of course, um, more susceptible to COVID-19. Uh, so I think that's a conversation that uh, has uh, kind of began uh, and that we need to have a little bit more is, you know, during you know, crisis points like this. Uh, is there a pathway to move the legislator uh, mobile? Uh, is there alternate, you know, meeting locations that give folks more, you know, space to social distance? Or can we do it digitally? Can we push it online? Because, uh, you know, we have to adapt to the times. I always say one of my favorite quotes are, or things I like to reference is, you know, Charles Darwin has some pretty strong opinions about uh, things that aren't able to adapt. And this is, a, again, a perfect example. Uh, our government, uh, especially elected leaders, we need to look, you know, down the road and how can we can adapt uh, going forward when we're presented with the next crisis. I mean, we've now got a situation where even if we're back to work, is it really smart for us to be getting together for a primary election? But we can't have the General Assembly act because of the limitations of acting as a group. Yes, and I think they can. You know, I'll say this, there's a will, there's a way. If they want to, uh, 
you know, figure their way th uh, through this, they, they certainly can. And, you know, and, and to the, the voting, you know, Virginia, uh, I feel like is kind of leading the way. They just passed, uh, you know, some major legislation. And uh, I, I'm a believer in vote by mail. I think, you know, voting should be made uh, as easy as possible for folks. And, you know, if the government can, you know, mail us a census, they can mail us a ballot. You know, there's, there's really uh, no debate to be had there that, you know, of course, we have to uh, be concerned with security and everything. Uh, but uh, vote by mail, I think uh, this is a perfect example of why that's something that's, that's needed. Now, where are you heading tomorrow? Well, um, I can't give specific uh, locations. Uh, I'm sure most folks know uh, I have been activated. I'm an Air Force Reservist. Uh, I did uh, nine years uh, active duty and uh, still serve in the reserves. And uh, I've been called up uh, because we, uh, what's happened worldwide. And uh, Colleen, how am I doing the sun? Do I need to adjust this a little bit? The sun just came out and uh, I'm getting blinded. So I just want to make sure you guys can still see me. We can see the bright side of your face. Great. Gotcha. Gotcha. I mean, <laughs> how about this? I'm going to adjust. I'm going to move this over a little bit. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, good idea. Just the chair here. Um, yeah, hazards of doing uh, outdoor interviews. You never know what the, the sun's going to do or the, the weather. And uh, like I mentioned before, we went live. The dog may be running around here in the background, too, uh, doing this thing. But, um, yeah, going back to uh, Air Force service, um, I am uh, on active duty orders right now. Um, so I've been flying uh, missions uh, in, uh, domestically here in the U.S. and then uh, also overseas. Uh, the military is very serious about uh, operational security. Uh, so I cannot, uh, before going on a mission, you know, give specific locations. I can say that I am headed to uh, Europe and the, the Middle East again. Uh, but on this past uh, mission, now that it's over, I can talk about it a little bit more. Uh, we were uh, in Germany, uh, two different locations there, and then a couple spots in the Middle East, including uh, Jordan, uh, Qatar, and Iraq. Well, we flew through uh, Iraqi airspace. Um, so yeah, we, they're keeping us busy. Uh, those days are incredibly long. Uh, we are max, absolute maximum duty day as a C-17 crew is uh, 24 hours. We usually have to have wow. uh, three pilots and uh, two low masters to do that. And it is taxing. I was kind of telling uh, Amy, my wife, uh, those long days, uh, they hit a little bit harder in your 30s than they do, do in your 20s. Um, and uh, generally, we'll get uh, a little bit of time uh, off in between missions to uh, kind of reset. And that's what I've been doing uh, here. I've had about uh, five days off uh, before my next mission. Uh, so we'll be heading out uh, again tomorrow to uh, fly international and uh, move supplies. But uh, one thing we uh, inadvertently, I think we set a record in South Carolina uh, political history uh, by being in Iraq uh, last week. I think I may be the only candidate in South Carolina history to be in an actual combat zone uh, during their campaign, which is not something we ever thought we would, we would do, but uh, that's kind of the nature of the world that we're, we're living in. So I think, uh, yeah, we set a, a new record here. Well, thank you for your service, Ed. We really appreciate it. I know yeah. it wasn't what you were anticipating having to do this year. Uh, well, you know, the country needs uh, is in a, in a time of need, and uh, this takes priority, so uh, ha happy to do it. Now, what do you do when you're back at home? Uh, so I've got a couple couple different jobs, and I'm going to move back into the sunlight here a little bit and try to at least stay all sun or all shade is a little bit diff difficult in this position. But uh, so my full-time job is I do uh, real estate. I uh, own a small uh, commercial redevelopment uh, real estate company called Simply Commercial. And uh, we're really focused in on the Upper Neck area, uh, Reynolds Avenue uh, in North Charleston. And uh, our interest is kind of revitalize that area and make it make it quite frankly cool again. Uh, I think we're at a time period where folks are starting to appreciate high density, uh, where you have uh, commercial and uh, residential uh, uh, businesses in the same structure, but also I'll say the, uh, the old school aspect of it too. So we're just trying to uh, recruit businesses to come back to that area and what uh, the buildings that are uh, abandoned or run down, we've been uh, fixing up and uh, really enjoy it. It's kind of cool to see a community uh, come back together, a new life be brought uh, back into it. And in a way I'll say it's a, a springboard into the state uh, rep run. Uh, I'm very uh, much believe in planning. Uh, you, you, you plan for success success uh, going down the road. And uh, I kind of, I say initially uh, got my hands warmed up doing the, uh, the Renner Avenue's work and kind of identified uh, that uh, there was needs on a larger state level. And being a, a resident of West Ashley, uh, of course, running for the district over here and uh, excited to kind of take what I've learned so far from community development, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, our infrastructure, uh, education, environmental controls, and kind of apply that to a, a larger level. Ed, I've got to tell you, I really appreciate what you've done up there. Of course, um, as you know, uh, I made a decision to move the Alliance for Full Acceptance, AFA, to Reynolds Avenue. And I think it's an area that really 
allows us to see some of the strengths and growths of Charleston benefit everybody. So I want to applaud you on your hard work up there. And thank you guys for coming to the street. You know, it's great that we can look, you know, the diversity of the neighborhood and uh, look forward. I know at one point you mentioned, obviously we can't do it now, but an awesome block party to kind of kick things off. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like I said, it's, it's a process and it's exciting. It's exciting to see, you know, something kind of uh, revitalize and come back to life. Well, and I appreciate how you've been able to create a group uh, that includes both business owners and residents and neighbors and really bring people together to make a good group decision. I think it really bodes well for you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You know, funny thing, you know, good things happen when different groups get together and, and talk. And uh, yes, we, uh, the Shakur Cherokee Neighborhood Association, we, we attend their meetings, they attend our meetings. So we're making sure that we're kind of uh, have a unified vision that we're kind of moving forward in the same direction. Also a, a number of uh, long-term uh, lo uh, nonprofits like Lamsey and, and Metanoia that are big parts of the neighborhood. So we make sure that we stay in touch and that uh, we communicate with one another. So we're kind of all, uh, for the most part, rowing in the same direction and uh, making some good things happen. Wonderful. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit more about issues affecting House District going 14? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I mentioned earlier uh, Highway 61. So that's kind of the, the spine of the district. Uh, that has been a bit of a, uh, and I'm not uh, overstating this, anybody who's driven it knows what uh, knows this to be the truth. That uh, is a bit of a traffic nightmare, uh, especially around the, the B is very uh, corridor there. And uh, one of the things we have to recognize is there are limitations uh, to what can be done uh, to kind of address that problem. And one of the big ones is we, we can't uh, go wider on 61. You know, that is, is a historic highway. Uh, the uh, residents along there have been very clear. There's been multiple attempts to uh, clear cut uh, live oaks along there. I'm not a favor of that. And uh, I think that that's a, a course that we should maintain. Uh, so we have to look at it from a, a efficiency standpoint. Uh, how can we make that road uh, more efficient? Uh, number uh, of different ideas out there. Uh, one would be uh, potentially maybe expanding the bus rapid transit into phase two, kind of having a return route. Now it's uh, plan on coming down Rivers Avenue from, from Summer, Somerville. Uh, maybe uh, in the future, there will be a return route option to where it goes back up 61 and connects with Somerville. And assuming, you know, wow. those buses, uh, you know, sit about 60 people, if we could even run them, you know, half full, uh, that's 30 cars every trip that you're potentially taking off the road. Uh, there's some other ideas, too, about uh, potentially a relief. Uh, for example, maybe extending the Glen McConnell uh, extension and uh, giving people more options to, to travel uh, on that side of town. So it's not solely just 61 uh, that everybody is uh, utilizing there. So traffic's a big thing. You know, we've all, uh, I, I feel like, uh, you know, if you sit on that traffic every day, you're, you know, the biggest uh, detriment is you're, you're missing family time. And uh, one of the big right. things is, you know, I think uh, responsibility of the government is make sure you're, you're spending time uh, at home with your family or, or whatever you, uh, you choose to do and not sitting in traffic. So that's one of the things, uh, you know, kind of the messages I've been hammering away with is, you know, get a plan for the future. And, uh, and I'll say right now, there, I had through my research, I haven't found much of a plan to improve that. So we're developing some ideas uh, internally and then also, uh, you know, working with uh, other neighborhood associations and nonprofits that have uh, interest in kind of uh, improving uh, that area. Uh, also, uh, kind of hand in hand with that is flooding. Uh, Church Creek is, is part of this district. And as far as West Ashley goes, that's one of the uh, the worst uh, flooded uh, areas uh, in, in, in West Ashley. And uh, we know we've got to, we got to think big. Uh, you know, one of the things is uh, the city is buying back uh, homes that have uh, a history of flooding, which I think is a good thing and turning low-lying areas back into parks. Uh, but we have to realize with sea level rise, uh, flooding's not going away uh, next year, quite frankly, ever. It's gonna think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is here to stay. Um, so there's a lot of good things uh, within the Dutch dialogues that we need to uh, kind of follow, but also seek funding for. And one of the things, uh, the research that we found uh, in, in this run is, uh, you know, the, the city is, is kind of leading the charge, uh, which is great. Uh, the county's playing a big role, but the state has largely been absent, especially on the, on the funding front, right? Um, so getting more state funding uh, back down this way, and I think the ultimate solution is probably some kind of uh, canal system uh, from Church Creek uh, that uh, ties into the Ashley River to quickly, uh, more efficiently move that water out uh, when we have uh, major rain events, but also looking at, uh, you know, how we develop upstream, because anything that happens uh, upstream is, needless to say, is going to flow downstream and affect neighborhoods uh, like Shadow Ross. Right. 
Um, so yeah, we got to We got to, uh, you know, think big here. Band-Aid solutions aren't going to work. Uh, doing nothing certainly is not going to work. And that's kind of been the theme, unfortunately, so far. Uh, so we got to pursue some big things and we got to get the state involved uh, because these issues, uh, you know, when, when your house is flooding, uh, you really don't care, you know, whether it's the city leading, whether it's the county leading, you know, the state leading, uh, your, your house is flooded. So we've got to get all all players on board and uh, get some solutions to people. Yeah, you need a strong team. Certainly, I found on council that if I didn't have somebody ready to work side by side with me from the state house, it, it definitely limited the options we had available to constituents. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Now, what what about the environment? Oh, the environment. I love, love to talk about the environment. And part of the reason I chose uh, backyard today is uh, we back up to the marsh here on the uh, Ashley River. And uh, I'll say uh, I'm a son of the low country. I, I did grow up in, in mid-state, but uh, moved down here for college and uh, big kayaker. Uh, I've got a little 14-foot John boat. Uh, I absolutely love spending time on the Ashley River, uh, in the harbor, on the Ashapo, on the Edisto. And, uh, and that's, you know, I, I don't think this is going to be controversial, Colleen, but I think this environment is something worth protecting and worth uh, saving. And uh, one of the big threats right now, or I'll say emergent threats that we have out there are uh, plastic pellets. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these uh, articles that have come out. Uh, the, they're also called nurdles. Uh, we generally just say plastic pellets because that's easier for, uh, for folks to uh, understand them because we, of course, we'll get the question right away. What is a nurdle? I'm like, it's a plastic pellet. Right. Um, and the uh, importers, plastic pellet importers, uh, have transitioned to Charleston Harbor big time. And uh, we're not necessarily, we're not against, you know, imports. We, we think a healthy port is a good thing for the economy, but we are against this pollution. And, and unfortunately, some of these uh, importers are uh, using open containers to move this product. And these containers sit outside, the wind blows, it goes into the water, and it ends up everywhere. And uh, last summer, there's a major, major spill. And believe it or not, it's still ongoing. I've gone out and uh, done audits with a couple of our um, environmental nonprofits, and these things are still washing up uh, at, at the Battery Park uh, downtown, uh, on our beaches and everywhere. And once they get into our environment, they're not leaving. Uh, these things are they are like that big. Uh, they had a crew last year out on Sullivan's Island. They were picking these things up with tweezers, which is, uh, quite frankly, I'm glad they're doing it, but it's also a little bit absurd because there's millions of these things and there's no way you're going to be able to, to get them. And you know, fish are eating them. Birds are eating them, uh, and quite frankly, plastics just do not belong in, in our marshes. So this is again uh, you know, something we have to adapt to. Something we have to change. Is uh, this is happening? This is ongoing. Uh, so what is the state going to do? And, uh, and right now, the answer has kind of been nothing. DHEC is um, not fine. Uh, the responsible uh, folks at all, uh, which I have a big problem with that because you know, Colleen, if you went or anybody watching this video went out to Kiwa or Sullivan's or, or uh, Isle Palms tomorrow, and you threw down a plastic cup. That's a fifteen hundred dollar fine. You're going to be fined fifteen hundred bucks for that. But we've got companies that are based out of state that have these you know, awesome tax breaks from our state that are dumping these things everywhere, and they've been fined a dollar. And uh, I, that does not sit well with me. I believe you know we we should all be following the same rules here. I mean, I, I'm glad they uh, the companies involved did some of the cleanup, but it certainly hasn't resolved the issue as you pointed out. It's still going on, and there's been no real ramifications for them to change their business practice. Uh, none of whatsoever. And honestly, until you start hitting them in the purse, they're going to keep doing their thing. You know, it's uh, unfortunately, I feel like for them, it's uh, it's about that bottom bottom line and uh, they're just looking to make as much profit. And unfortunately, uh, you know, this marsh right here behind me is, is suffering. And, uh, we, we have to protect it. This is our environment to protect. And, you know, uh, one day, you know, of course, be handed the reins off the trip. And I want to give him, uh, you know, a, a healthy community, a healthy environment and, and for him to continue that, you know, legacy of uh, protecting what we have. Now, you don't have a primary opponent, is that correct? That is correct. No, no primary opponent. So I am the, the Democratic nominee for State House 114. Congratulations. Thank so you. So you're getting ready for, for the general election. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Sam. We're, we're gearing, gearing up for it. Uh, uh, very exciting. Uh, you know, one of the early uh, indicators in our race, of course, is fundraising. Uh, that is something that we've been uh, working on for a while now. And uh, we just uh, last Friday is when all the, the quarter one reports came out. And uh, we are we in quarter one, we outraised uh, the incumbent. We we're just shy of a four to one uh, outraising uh, the current incumbent, the seat, which is huge. And uh, we're leading uh, all the state house races right now and overall uh, fundraising as well. And I think that's a pretty uh, 
uh, uh, good indication or good support, you know, that people, they, they won't, you know, they won't engage leadership. They, they want somebody that has a plan, you know, going forward for our future because, uh, and especially in times of, you know, crisis like this, you know, the, the whole, oh, let's have an incredibly limited government approach and, you know, we, we don't just completely, you know, get rid of all our, our safety nets. It doesn't work. And, and, and I think it just, this problem right now is just exacerbated, you know, or, or exposed that uh, we need uh, engaged uh, state, le state leaders on all levels to uh, address our needs. Well, and I certainly think that while early money is always important this year in light of the situation, it's wonderful that you were prepared and working hard early. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Now, I don't think we've mentioned where you went to college. Some yes, people might yes. want to know that. Yeah, so actually on the other side of the uh, the river here, uh, I went to the, uh, the Citadel and uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, kind of core belief here is uh, service. Uh, I, I talk about service a lot. Um, September 11th happened my senior year in high school. And uh, I kind of at that point, um, it was uh, either uh, University of South Carolina uh, or the Citadel. And uh, I knew that day uh, that was going to be the Citadel because uh, I was going to serve. Uh, you know, we're... Uh, and sorry, I get a little choked up sometimes when we're talking about it. But, uh, you know, our again, our country is in time of need, and I wanted to do something. So uh, it was the Citadel. And uh, re uh, actually, one day before I graduated, I commissioned into the Air Force. And like I mentioned, been been flying uh, ever since. But uh, really enjoy it. Uh, the Citadel uh, community has been uh, absolutely outstanding. Uh, we have a strong, strong uh, tradition of uh, Democratic politicians from uh, Mayor Joe Riley, uh, uh, Governor John West, and uh, Senator Hollings. And Senator Hollings' family has been a big support so far, Mayor Riley as well. And uh, kind of in a, in a way, I, I feel, like you mentioned a hand in the range. Uh, it's a trip one day, I felt uh, a duty to those gentlemen that I just mentioned to kind of carry on uh, their legacy of, uh, of caring, caring for folks and, uh, and doing right by the environment. Wonderful. Well, Ed, thank you so much for your time today. I want to make sure we get your website out there. What is your website? Our website is uh, suttonforsc.com. Uh, and then uh, same thing on Facebook, uh, Sutton for SC. Uh, you can Google us there, and then I'm sure you'll see all the hashtags uh, on Twitter and everything as well. And uh, why I'm traveling, I am doing uh, Twitter uh, updates. Have to be very clear. That's my personal account, uh, not, a, not a campaign account on uh, on Twitter uh, for, for military legal purposes there. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you want to follow the kind of the travels, uh, and again, I can't tell you uh, location prior, but after, after a couple of days uh, in the rear, uh, I could kind of tell you about where I've been and what we've been up to. Sounds great. Ed, thanks so much for your time today. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Awesome. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you.